Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And I uh, would like to welcome you to uh, yet another uh, seminar of the Armour Technical Committee on Induced Seismicity. Uh, on behalf of uh, the committee, uh, I wish you all uh, a very happy uh, weekend yet to come. And uh, we are fortunate today to uh, have David Eaton from the University of Calgary. Uh, where he will uh, present uh, a uh, talk on a very interesting topic regarding the um, role of uh, uh, slow slip, slow fault slip on uh, injection-induced seismicity. I'm uh, very keen on uh, uh, hearing what he has to say on this uh, uh, interesting topic. And as usual, uh, we have a few announcements pertaining to the uh, committee work and um, uh, future speakers, and so uh, I would like to ask uh, Sean to uh, uh, take it over and uh, uh, inform us of uh, what is about to come. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ahmad. So just looking at the upcoming schedule, November 4th, we have Stan Lasowski with the Polish Academy of Sciences. He's going to be uh, presenting uh, material on uh, uh, an effort underway with his group looking at a uh, open access platform called Episodes to collaborate on induced seismicity research. So I think a interesting topic for many. And then uh, December, Jean-Philippe Avurek from uh, Caltech will be presenting. Uh, title yet to be determined, but uh, another interesting talk. And then uh, we're just getting the program together for tw early 2023, so more to come. So pass it over to uh, Madi. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. This is Mahdi from the Bureau of Economic Geology. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for joining us for another uh, webinar. Uh, uh, and uh, for better uh, logistics of this webinar, uh, everyone will be muted during the talk. And uh, what, uh, please keep this in mind you, that you can submit your questions during or after the talk in the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom meeting window. And please send these questions to everyone in order to uh, summarize the repetitive questions. Uh, and this specific uh, uh, presentation is recorded uh, and it will be uploaded in our YouTube channel. The link to this channel is in the invitation email. And please subscribe to receive notifications uh, of future recorded talks uh, in this YouTube channel. And as Sean mentioned, we have talks uh, set up until December, but uh, if you see any interesting presentations in, uh, in the event, please let us know. We can invite them to present for us uh, for January 2023 and later on. Uh, thank you so much. Without further delay, let's invite David to take over the stage and present uh, his talk. Thank you. Well, thank you for that uh, kind introduction and uh, thank you very much to the committee for the opportunity to uh, um, give uh, this presentation. Um, as uh, many of you I'm sure know, um, slow fault slip or aseismic processes uh, do not radiate seismic wave energy as, in the same way as regular earthquakes, but they're nevertheless a, an important component of the energy budget of natural fault systems, as well as uh, hydraulic fracture growth. Um, it's a topic that uh, my research group has been focused on for the last few years, particularly trying to understand um, what the implications may be of slow fault slip for injection-induced seismicity. Uh, so what I'll be presenting today is uh, co-authored by Thomas Ayer, um, and actually most of what I'll be uh, uh, presenting is covered in a leading edge article, which is in press right now. Um, this has been a collaborative uh, effort, and I would like to acknowledge contributions from the people listed here who've uh, all contributed ideas and in uh, some cases slides for this presentation. So here's an outline of my uh, uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about naturally occurring slow slip phenomena. Uh, so a few decades ago, uh, the field of seismology underwent a bit of a paradigm shift uh, where it's now recognized that uh, natural earthquakes exhibit a spectrum of behavior of which regular earthquakes are an end member. So there's a whole variety of different slow slip phenomena which go from um, 
very slow earthquakes, which can, which can take years to occur, uh, up through low frequency uh, um, earthquakes that are bear some similarity to uh, earthquakes that we generally attribute to fault slip. Um, it, well, it should become clear uh, as I'm talking about that, that uh, one of the really important controlling factors is the uh, velocity strengthening versus velocity weakening rheology, frictional rheology of uh, faults. And so to understand this, we have to talk a little bit about um, rate state friction. Uh, from there, we're gonna move into some uh, examples of uh, induced slow fault slip, um, which uh, illustrate how we think this fits together and what some of the implications are. And I'm gonna conclude by uh, talking about uh, why this matters in our opinion for uh, induced earthquakes. This actually came from, I, I presented a short version of this presentation at the SEG Induced Seismicity Workshop in June. And this question came up, you know, uh, if, uh, uh, why should we care? Why should regulators care about uh, slow fault slip? So I'll try to address that question here. So let's start uh, uh, from the beginning. By definition, uh, slow fault slip is uh, simply slip on a fault that is too slow to radiate seismic wave energy. Um, and seismologists have known about this for uh, many decades, um, initially from direct observations, such as what's illustrated uh, on the left. Uh, so this is just a built uh, structure that crosses the North Anatolian Fault in Turkey. Um, and so it's, uh, it's obvious that we're seeing deformation of structures like this um, at faults like San Andreas or North Anatolian Fault, which aren't associated with uh, earthquakes. So there's a whole wealth of different phenomenology that's associated with uh, a slow fault slip. So some examples are slow slip events, which are aseismic slip transients on a fault patch with durations ranging from minutes to decades. And then uh, tectonic tremor, which is a persistent low frequency seismic signals that uh, is inferred to be associated with otherwise slow slip on a fault. So this is a, a, a diagram uh, taken from a, re a review paper by uh, Bergman. Um, it uh, shows the, uh, the structure of the San Andreas Fault um, at the transition between, uh, at an area where there's a transition from uh, regular seismic rupture into slow slip rupture along the fault. Um, I'm starting with uh, strike slip earthquakes because they're important in the induced seismicity perspective. Um, and uh, we've known about slow slip processes for a little longer for strike slip fault systems. Uh, so in this, you can see that uh, there's a profound change at the brittle ductal transition, which is about 15 kilometers depth uh, in this area. Um, and we see that in exposed sections of uh, faults as well. But uh, above the brittle uh, ductal transition, the uh, slow slip on the fault is manifested in a number of different ways. Creep, as I was just showing, uh, slow slip events, and then sometimes repeating earthquakes, uh, which are thought to be repeated slip on a stuck patch or an asperity um, on, on a fault. Uh, if we go below the brittle ductal transition, we see a variety of processes, uh, including creep and slow slip events, but also including tremor, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about next. Now, where I personally really started to take notice of uh, slow slip processes uh, was following a presentation um, shortly after the publication of this paper in Science in 2003. Uh, the presentation was by Herb Draggart, who is a geodesist with the Geological Survey of Canada, um, and one of the pioneers in recognizing slow slip processes in the Cascadia subduction zone. So in this diagram, these, uh, these blue dots represent change in the baseline between a uh, GPS station on Vancouver Island and one in uh, near Penticton in the interior of British Columbia. Um, and what was expected was a, just a slow continuous shortening of that baseline uh, due to tectonic forces at the plate boundary. Uh, but what was actually observed was a higher rate of shortening with intermittent backslipping um, so uh, westward backslipping of the station on Vancouver Island. And according to Herb, when he presented this, um, the first few times this was observed, it was assumed that this was a problem with the, uh, with the recording system. Uh, but it was checked and double checked. And then after this had occurred a number of, for a number of uh, other repetitions, it was realized this is actually recording 
a natural behavior of the fault system. And then uh, comparison with uh, observations from the, the seismic network showed that every time one of these slow slip events occurred, it coincided with tremor activity uh, in the area. So this is incoherent seismic signals um, or less coherent seismic signals, which um, were uh, kind of localized along part of the fault and uh, occurred in time at the same time as these uh, uh, slow slip events. Uh, so I found this really interesting. I thought this is telling us something fundamental about the dynamics of the subduction system. So this uh, cross section is taken from a review paper published a few years later. It encapsulates what was then emerging as the understanding of how all this uh, fits together. Uh, so the um, rare, uh, very large megathrust uh, earthquakes on the subduction interface um, nucleate within the region which is shown in red on this diagram. Um, and so this is a part of the interface which is currently uh, stuck. Um, and for which the frictional rheology is velocity weakening. The uh, tremor and the slow slip events uh, occur a little bit deeper down on the subduction interface in a region which is shown in yellow on here. Um, and the frictional rheology in this section is considered to be uh, conditionally stable. And as you get deeper as well as shallower on the subduction interface, we reach a section of the uh, interface where continuous sliding is thought to be occurring. So very similar to below the brittle ductile transition on the, the San Andreas fault. And in this section of the fault, the frictional rheology is thought to be velocity strengthening. So this partitioning of the subduction interface really reflects the character of the, or the frictional rheology, whether it's velocity strengthening or velocity weakening along that part of the interface. Now, later in the talk, when I'm uh, describing some of these uh, signals that we see from induced earthquakes, I'll ask you to try to remember this partitioning of the fault segment and how they're related together. I'll also just mention that uh, there is an idea that every time a slow slip event occurs on this deeper segment of the, uh, the interface, that actually loads the stuck part of the interface a little bit. And therefore, there might be a time-dependent uh, increase in the risk of a megathrust earthquake during these slow-slip events. So what controls the uh, velocity strengthening versus velocity weakening behavior of these faults? Well, to understand this, we have to look at the constitutive model defined by rate state friction. Um, and this is one example of how that is expressed. This is uh, the most widely used uh, version of this, it was first described by Jim Dietrich uh, back in the 1970s, based on uh, laboratory measurements that have now been repeated uh, many, many times. So if you think of uh, um, taking a fault zone and uh, it experiences a step change, a step increase in velocity, and what the laboratory measurements reveal is that the friction along that interface exhibits a transient increase followed by a gradual reduction in friction to a new steady state level. Um, so it's described by this uh, uh, formula, um, U is friction, V is the sliding velocity, theta is a state or memory variable along the fault. And then there's some material parameters. Um, these are simply called the A and B parameter, and then there's a critical slip distance. But as this evolves to a new steady state uh, friction level, uh, this new friction level is described by the formula that's, that's shown here. And you can see there's this coefficient A minus B that determines whether the system is velocity strengthening or velocity weakening. So if A minus B is negative, we get velocity weakening. And in that case, uh, we can uh, dynamic rupture can occur. So once uh, slip initiates, uh, friction drops, that accelerates the slip and it uh, proceeds into a regular earthquake. But where there's velocity strengthening, then it's, a, it's rate limited. So as slip uh, initiates, it reaches uh, a steady state uh, slip velocity and then continues at that slow slip velocity that produces these aseismic creep events. Now, uh, in order to characterize this for uh, fault systems that we're interested in for unconventional uh, oil and gas, uh, we look to some laboratory measurements. And uh, this is a compilation of uh, various published 
lab measurements uh, for fine-grained sedimentary rocks from unconventional uh, systems, uh, including shales. Um, and it's plotted here with a uh, um, friction coefficient on the horizontal axis and this rate state parameter, so the A minus B difference on the vertical axis. And again, if A minus B is positive, then we expect velocity strengthening. So we expect a fault to behave in a uh, creep-like manner. Um, and where A minus B is negative, then we expect velocity weakening. And this is the regime where we could expect to see dynamic rupture and uh, earthquake processes happening. Um, and the colors that are shown on here represent the clay fraction in the sample, which is tested. And it's evident when we look at this that as clay increases, there's a tendency for this A minus B parameter to become more positive. So this is uh, hot off the press, uh, new data. Um, this uh, is work that was published by uh, uh, my engineering colleagues here at the University of Calgary. It was presented at the Geo Calgary meeting earlier this week. Uh, so uh, Bourbon and Priest uh, took some uh, samples from um, an exposed equivalent to the Duvernay Formation from the Canadian Rocky Mountains. Uh, they classified it according to uh, lithology um, and uh, then performed a, a set of rate state friction experiments using the experimental apparatus at Penn State University. Um, the main takeaway from this is that every sample except for one, uh, which was a carbonate rich debris flow, uh, exhibited positive A minus B values. So uh, we could conclude that the expectation is if there's a fault that intersects the Duvernay formation, then we would expect it to behave in um, an aseismic manner um, if it is um, pushed into a frictional instability due to fluid uh, injection. Uh, we have this one sample that's, uh, that's shown here that one might consider to be conditionally stable, much like uh, I talked about for uh, subduction zones. So that uh, is pretty interesting results and it uh, comes back to um, impact the interpretation of one of the inferred slow slip events that I'll be referring to. Now um, I'll start things off with uh, for examples of slow fault slip with this um, very nice paper that was published in Science by Guglielmi and others in uh, 2015. And uh, what this paper describes is an experiment where uh, a well was drilled through a known fault. Um, and then a probe called a SIMFIP probe was used to pack the fault off, allowing the fault to be uh, uh, pressurized. Um, and then the uh, strain and uh, displacement components could be very precisely measured uh, using the probe as shown here. And uh, the expectation was that uh, this fault would behave aseismically, and that was borne out by the, uh, the measurements. Um, so uh, as this experiment was being uh, conducted, so you can see the uh, pressure and um, injection rates that are, are shown here. Uh, the initial deformation on the fault was a tensile opening, followed by a fault slip, which was entirely aseismic in nature. Uh, now, this uh, experiment included uh, observation systems, so microseismic systems that recorded microseismicity, but this all occurred around the fault as an indirect result of aseismic creep on the fault. Um, so this experiment was done at the scale of a few meters. Um, so to just scale this up to uh, you know, full industry scale, I'll look at a uh, series of publications that um, my group has uh, produced for a magnitude 4.1 induced event uh, on a strike slip fault in uh, west central Alberta. It's the Duvernay Play west of Fox Creek. Um, and in this particular case, and so the event occurred in 2016, um, it was a very robust acquisition system that was being used. So um, there was a single horizontal well which was being treated with a, um, a multi multiple stage hydraulic fracturing. Um, there were 93 shallow borehole arrays. So these were geophone arrays with geophones cemented into a shallow well at depths of 27, 21, and 14 meters. Um, and so this provided a very uh, good resolution of micro seismicity during the, the event. There were also four broadband stations which helped out with the magnitude calibration. So this is 
what the, uh, the micro seismicity looked like that occurred during the treatment program up until the, uh, the treatment was, uh, was terminated at stage 26 upon the occurrence of a magnitude 4.1 induced event. So on the map view on the right, uh, all of the dots show micro seismicity. It's colored based on the occurrence time. So uh, the latest events are shown in yellow and the earliest events are shown in blue. And you can see this in cross section on the left. Um, and one thing you notice, this was a very atypical uh, hydraulic fracturing program uh, because almost all the events occurred either above or below the treatment zone. Um, and the, the main shock itself occurred several hundred meters above uh, the treatment zone within a massive carbonate unit called the, uh, um, the Wabaman formation. Um, and if you're skeptical about the depths uh, from this array, I'll just simply note that uh, all of the perforations from the, uh, uh, each of these stages were well recorded um, and the velocity model accurately located the perforations along here. So the, uh, um, just simply the uh, S minus P time picks required these events to be shallower. Uh, I'll also note, uh, um, we found it interesting, we had 3D seismic data um, from this area. So this is just superimposing the uh, map view micro seismicity onto a time slice from the 3D seismic just below uh, the Duvernay zone. And uh, below the Duvernay, uh, there is a reef edge. So this is a Swan Hills reef. Uh, so uh, on reef, it is a um, massive carbonate unit. Um, and off reef, we have a fine grained um, rocks within the waterways formation. And if we zoom in, we see that uh, below the, um, uh, below the Duvernay, we're seeing events that appear to line up parallel to the edge of the reef. So we think that that uh, validates the likelihood that there's structural controls on, on what we're seeing here. Now, the, the timing and depth of this main shock event was a bit of a head scratcher for us. Uh, so uh, when we first started looking at this, we were working within the current conceptual models for uh, induced earthquakes, uh, namely that they could occur um, due to a pore pressure increase um, on the fault. So if we intersect a fault uh, by the hydraulic fractures, we can increase the, the pore pressure leading to an induced earthquake or simply to a change in, in fault loading conditions. Uh, but here um, we, we found it odd that uh, we weren't seeing any kind of Kaiser effect like triggering front that connected the main shock back to the, uh, um, the injection well. And this event occurred during uh, the uh, injection of one of the stages, but the timing was just a little bit hard to explain through either of these two models. So we proposed a, a new model. Um, so we knew from the 3D seismic data that there was a fault, a basement rooted fault, which extended up through the Duvernay zone up into the, uh, uh, the Wabman level. Um, so we hypothesized that the uh, um, pressure increase on the fault during hydraulic fracturing uh, was driving a seismic uh, slip on the fault. So it wasn't producing micro seismicity that we could observe with the, uh, the network. But as that was occurring, um, it was loading other parts of the fault, both above and below. And just by happenstance, the, uh, the main shock occurred above, but it's important to emphasize that this model doesn't require the uh, um, earthquake to occur above. It could just as easily occur uh, below. But it was the fact that it was above that really got us thinking about trying to find a different model. Um, so the model is kind of nicely represented in this block diagram uh, that uh, you can see here. So again, um, hydraulic fracturing in the Duvernay level, pressurizing a fault, driving a slow slip on the fault within an expanding region that progressively loads a stuck part of uh, uh, the fault, which has uh, velocity weakening uh, rheology. So once we initiate slip on here, it, uh, it produces the induced earthquake. So uh, we teamed up with uh, Dimitri Garagash, uh, who did some um, numerical modeling using um, a fully coupled rate state uh, friction code. So he took all of the 26 treatment stages, incorporated the um, injected uh, rates and volumes uh, into the simulation. And we postulated the model, which is shown on, um, on the right, 
Um, and uh, so the, the rate state modeling requires some initial reference velocity. So uh, we, we postulated that uh, uh, this fault had been undergoing pressurization uh, throughout the period of um, hydrocarbon uh, maturity in this, this zone. So in the diagram you're looking at right now, there's uh, in the middle of this slide, uh, the, the slip contours are shown here where this is 25 centimeters. Uh, so these, these dash lines are showing slip on the fault modeled with this code every 10 million years. So exceedingly slow slip. Um, and then slip that occurred aseismically during hydraulic fracturing is shown with gray contours every five and a half hours. And they just merge together to create this, uh, this gray zone that you can see here. Um, and then the dynamic rupture um, is uh, illustrated with the red contours. So these are every 0 0.01 seconds. And so we can see tens of centimeters of a modeled slip on the fault. And this extends down into the Duvernay zone, which uh, agrees with the notion that these rocks are conditionally stable, much like the conditionally uh, stable parts of uh, subduction zones. And one other uh, interesting thing is that uh, Dimitri found that uh, he was only able to model an event up to magnitude 3.4, whereas the observed magnitude was 4.1. But if he incorporated some uh, recent lab data showing flash heating in carbonates, uh, he was able to, uh, um, to exactly reproduce the observed moment for that earthquake. So I'd like to uh, move on to a second uh, case study. This is uh, coming from a recent publication this year, um, and it's based on um, interferometric synthetic aperture radar, or uh, INSAR, combined with casing deformation. And while the previous case study that I showed was uh, indirect evidence in that uh, uh, we didn't actually observe the slow slip, but we inferred its existence because it explained a variety of other observations, here we think we actually have direct observations of uh, slow slip occurring, this time in the absence of uh, a triggered dynamic rupture. So if you're not familiar uh, with uh, um, INSAR, uh, basically we have uh, uh, satellites in orbit around the Earth. Uh, the satellites have an active uh, radar transmitter uh, that emits a pulse which uh, reflects off the Earth's uh, surface, uh, is able to propagate through uh, clouds unlike uh, visible light. So, and if we have multiple passes over the same part of the uh, Earth with a radar satellite, then we can use interferometry to record the difference in the path length uh, based on a phase difference um, from the um, INSAR. Um, and so that phase shift is then converted into ground motion. And the raw data show these fringes, uh, but we can unwrap the, we can phase unwrap these fringes in order to get a, uh, a recording of ground displacement along the line of sight of the path from the satellite. So here is a, a diagram which is taken from our uh, uh, paper published in Scientific Reports. Uh, it's a pretty busy diagram, so I'll try to unpack it here for you. Uh, we'll start with the inset in the top right, which is showing uh, phase unwrapped ground displacement images, so interferograms, for two different satellite passes. So uh, this is using the Sentinel-1 uh, INSAR satellite and the, the black rectangles in the map uh, show the locations of these different uh, uh, satellite passes. And also shown on here, these, uh, um, these black horizontal lines represent um, hydraulically fractured wells. So, uh, um, so that these are two wells. So we can see that the ground deformation pattern uh, is co-located with a hydraulic fracturing program. And as I'll show you in a minute, there's a clear temporal association between uh, these events as well. And what actually initiated this, this study is that Sergei Samsonov from the Canada Center for Earth Observation um, approached us with these interferograms and he was puzzled because they look like an earthquake, but when he checked the catalog, there was no earthquake that occurred at that time. Um, so uh, uh, the study area, which is shown in the red box, uh, sits within the Montney unconventional uh, play, uh, which is a very large um, unconventional um, gas and liquids fairway in Western Canada. Uh, so this is the BC part of the Montney. And some areas of the Montney appear to be prone to induced seismicity. So the, 
the blue and green colors you can see here uh, represent the spatial density of uh, earthquakes that have been recorded by the monitoring systems in this area. And the pink dots that you're looking at are producing gas wells. Uh, and these are all producing gas wells from all formations. So some of them, uh, especially in this area south of uh, Fort St. John, and uh, this area in the northern part of the Montney Play uh, represent pad drilling for the Montney. So this is horizontal wells and multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. Uh, but they're also conventional gas producing wells. And I'll particularly highlight this line of pink dots that you can see here. Uh, so these are gas wells in a structurally uh, bound uh, zone. They're uh, DeBolt gas producers. Uh, they occur along the blueberry fault structure, which is a buried thrust fault in the foreland of the Northern Canadian Rockies. So this is a Laramide age uh, thrust that produced a structural gas trap. And if we just follow that line of pink wells from the Blueberry Fault down into our area, we can see that it extends down into the um, study area that we're interested in here. So we wanted to validate the robustness of the uh, um, INSAR observations in a temporal sense. Um, so uh, what you're looking at here is uh, one example of uh, ground deformation. And we're going to look uh, simply at the, um, uh, the difference between points P1 and P2 uh, in this diagram for repeated satellite passes on four different tracks. So two of them are ascending two, and two of them are descending tracks. Um, and you can see the, uh, the difference that's shown here is the dots with the uh, uncertainties shown as well. Um, and uh, the signal that you're looking at here coincided with the time of the, the red bar that I'm showing. Um, and so according to, uh, to Sergey, um, there is a negligible chance that this is just a, a coincidence. Um, so uh, we can be, uh, with a high level of certainty, conclude that this occurred at the time of the, the red bar that we're looking at. So let's uh, zoom in a little bit again on the location of the two hydraulically fractured wells. And on the right, you can see the, um, uh, based on publicly available data, uh, what was the injection schedule from these wells? Uh, so one was drilled into the middle Montney and one was drilled into the lower part of uh, the Montney. Um, and so these are the uh, cumulative volume uh, on a daily basis for the two wells. And uh, this injection program was terminated midway through the program. So the wells were being zipper fracked. Um, it turns out due to uh, casing deformation. So this took place in September of uh, of 2017. Um, and above this, you can see on the black lines, the timing of the satellite passes. Um, so uh, the, the dots show the, fir the first and second satellite pass. So we know that we can constrain the deformation to have occurred within the time interval that's shown here. And then on track 13, we know the deformation was in progress at the time of the middle dot, because we can see it on both of these uh, uh, two passes. So we have some information about when the, uh, um, the deformation occurred, and it coincides with the time of casing deformation that took place during the hydraulic fracturing. So we don't have public information to help us really constrain the uh, uh, casing deformation here, but we do know based on publications that it's a known operational issue in this area. Uh, so this is a diagram just meant for uh, illustration to visualize what this looks like, but this is from the Altairs field, and it was half a millimeter of uh, uh, casing deformation. But uh, larger instances of casing deformation have been documented in the nearby Farrell Creek uh, field, so this is work by Pat McClellan, um, up to five centimeters of displacement of, uh, of casing. And it's important to note that that is essentially the same magnitude that is calculated based on our models for the uh, uh, casing deformation as a result of this uh, INSAR. So if we go back to the map view now, um, here are the two hydraulically fractured wells and the cyan dots are showing uh, the stages that were completed in 2017 up until the point in time where the, uh, the program was uh, terminated. And the, uh, um, uh, the size of these circles is proportional to the volume that was injected. And the uh, contours you're looking at represent 
calculated displacement contours on the fault based on slip inversion. Uh, so we're seeing some large values up to uh, 25 centimeters, so very similar uh, to what was calculated in the previous study by Dmitry uh, Garagash. Um, and uh, the best fitting mechanism for the ground displacement patterns is a shallow dipping thrust fault dipping at eight degrees to the southwest. Um, and uh, that thrust fault is not at the same depth as the wells, but it intersects the build part of the wells at uh, approximately the location where the casing uh, deformation occurred um, and predicts uh, sort of five to 10 or five plus uh, centimeters of uh, slip at the well by casing deformation. And you can also see that the point of initiation of rupture is very close to the final stage that was completed um, during this hydraulic fracturing. Now, the company that did this work uh, was able to get back in in 2018 and uh, finish the hydraulic fracturing in the, these wells. And so the stages are shown here in the darker blue color. Uh, so, um, sorry, I uh, forgot to pull up the, uh, um, so here's the, uh, the build section of the well, the approximate location. And so uh, Sergey uh, scoured the uh, um, INSAR signals and uh, was able to show that there was a second um, slow slip event, uh, this time smaller in magnitude. So the 2017 event has a seismic moment equivalent to a moment magnitude five earthquake. And the 2018 event was a smaller moment magnitude 4.2 and was displaced to the north of the, um, the treatment wells here. So uh, our model for this is that the uh, hydraulic fracturing, the, so the uh, pressurization um, led to a slow slip activation in a uh, thrust, a buried thrust fault system, uh, which is known to exist in this area. Um, so this is actually taken from a, a recent paper where we had uh, 3D seismic data um, uh, from roughly the same uh, area. Um, and you can see the character of the faults that are shown here. Remember, this is a four to one uh, vertical exaggeration that, uh, that we're looking at here. Um, so where it's uh, showing offset on the DeBolt marker, um, this is a, uh, a fault propagation fold that extends upward into the, uh, um, into the Monty. And uh, these uh, faults are interpreted to sole into the underlying BAMP formation. So it's a rat, ramp flat geometry for the, uh, the faults. So um, in kind of a more regional view, uh, this is a hugely exaggerated uh, uh, cross section uh, showing the, um, the Northern Rocky Mountain thrust belt uh, over here. We're seeing the foreland buried uh, thrust system, uh, which we argue is being activated uh, during the hydraulic fracturing. Um, and there are known weak glide planes uh, within these units that have been recognized based on geomechanical uh, work. And so we, uh, we suspect that the, um, the fault that was activated coincided with a, a weak glide plane. It's also interesting to see that uh, if we look at the scaling, so uh, based on time and magnitude of these events, they plot within uh, the region which is defined by slow slip events for natural earthquake fault systems. Uh, so here's the 2017 event with the, the known timing constraints and here's uh, 2018 as well. Um, I'll just uh, briefly mention that there's a change in scaling which uh, reflects the, uh, the geometry of the fault. So once the rupture zone has uh, expanded to the point where it's constrained by the surface or the brittle ductal transition, uh, then the scaling behavior uh, changes, but we're plotting in this unbounded growth uh, area. And there's a variety of other phenomena, slow slip phenomena, which are observed in natural fault systems like low frequency earthquakes and very low frequency uh, earthquakes. And these, in addition to tremor signals, would be very interesting for us to try to um, understand and characterize for um, uh, induced seismicity. So the last observation I wanted to share with you today um, is from a DAS program. So, uh, um, so this is from um, a completion in Western Canada. Uh, what you're looking at is a waterfall to plot, a plot um, is depicting strain where uh, the red colors are showing extension and the blue colors are showing compression. Uh, this is in a near 
vertical monitor well with depth increasing down to the bottom of the well here. Um, so the target formation was here um, at this depth that's highlighted in yellow. And uh, there are some frac hit signatures which are shown. Um, and these uh, uh, have signatures which are what is expected during uh, hydraulic fracturing and has been well documented. Um, but we're also seeing some upward growth of this uh, um, uh, extensional uh, signature above the target zone. And then this really interesting feature, which is uh, shown here. And uh, we are interpreting this feature as a slow slip event, uh, which was triggered above the uh, injection zone during the hydraulic fracturing operations. And here, by the way, is three hours for scale. And 21 hours after the completion of this stage, uh, there was a small earthquake, magnitude 1.7, that was recorded um, on the uh, regional seismograph network. And if we take the uh, DAS observations and change the filter parameters, so uh, the waterfall plot on the left um, is downsampled to one hertz. Uh, on the right, we have the full uh, sample rate, uh, just a three second window. And we can see that that uh, 1.7 induced event was well recorded by uh, the DAS and the location puts it here, right between these two other uh, signals. Uh, so we're, we're really excited about this because I, we think this could be um, a, a representation of these slow slip uh, processes observed using DAS. Now, uh, we're very interested in trying to recognize um, tremor signals, again, by analogy to natural fault systems. Um, and there were some publications uh, uh, that uh, came out uh, uh, particularly in the Barnett play in uh, uh, North Texas, which had attributed uh, signals that look like this to possible uh, tremor activity that could be linked to slow slip processes. Um, unfortunately, that turned out to be not the case. So there's this paper uh, published by Zekovich and others in, uh, um, in geophysics where they showed that uh, some of the Barnett examples, which had been cited as possible long period, long duration events, uh, were actually uh, what was then emerging to be understood as uh, fluid-induced earthquakes happening in um, central Oklahoma and uh, in North Texas. So this is just the coda from these induced earthquakes convolved with the, uh, the geophone signal. And we published a paper in geophysics in 2015 that also talks about similar types of signals um, in Alberta. So I'll wrap things up then um, with uh, just a few comments. And as I said, I wanted to address um, why I believe uh, slow fault slip matters for injection induced seismicity. So my first point is this uh, may actually be more common than we assume. Um, and uh, I, this statement is based on two things. One analogy with natural fault systems, where uh, we know that only a fraction of the total fault slip energy um, is radiated seismically. Uh, we know that hydraulic fractures behave this way. We also know that uh, um, if we, where we've measured the, uh, um, the rate state parameters for these fine-grained rocks, they often appear to have velocity strengthening rheology. Um, however, uh, in general, we are probably not using the best monitoring tools to observe it. So we have to know what to look for and how to ask the question in order to really understand how common this is. Now, just in terms of the importance from an industry uh, point of view, um, understanding slow slip might help us to understand casing deformation um, as well. So casing deformation is itself an operational risk, um, much like induced seismicity. And from anecdotally, from my discussions with operators, most reports of casing deformation don't appear to be linked to any anomalous induced seismic events. Um, so our interpretation is that means that the, the process is essentially a seismic that's uh, producing these. Another reason why it might be important, particularly for regulators, is that slow slip might be a precursory signal. Uh, so for example, our loading model for the 2016 event in the Duvernay play invokes precursory slow a seismic slip. Um, so it stands to reason if we if we had that information, that might have been useful to know for short-term hazard forecasts. There's also new evidence that um, what are referred to as hybrid waveforms, so lower frequency waveforms, might manifest a transition from aseismic to seismic 
uh, slip. So this was published last year in Nature Communications by you et al. And so this might be sort of pointing us in the direction of what we need to look for. Um, and uh, uh, so it's possible that if uh, slow slip is uh, in some cases a precursory signal that that might be something that could be incorporated into the uh, recently emerging adaptive traffic light systems. In addition, um, slow slip uh, uh, earthquakes or slow slip processes could be a driving mechanism for earthquake swarm activity, uh, which could be important for understanding when it's safe to resume operations. So we published a paper in BSSA um, that covers that topic. And finally, I'll go out on a limb and be really speculative here, but uh, um, if uh, slow slip events are occurring in conditionally stable frictional rheology, um, then perhaps it might be possible if we really understand the physics to design injection schemes that favor a seismic slip and therefore suppress dynamic fault rupture. So this is admittedly pie in the sky, but something that uh, I think is worth considering. So uh, just to summarize a few final thoughts. Um, so a seismic fault creep uh, reflects the frictional rheology, so velocity strengthening versus velocity weakening, and is commonly observed in natural fault systems. Um, a number of previous studies have shown direct observations of a seismic slip at the decametric scale um, and indirect observations of uh, slow slip at the kilometer scale. Um, and uh, we've recently published a study using INSAR, uh, which shows a slow slip event equivalent to a moment magnitude five uh, earthquake uh, that was also directly linked to casing deformation. And I'll point out that there is another recent INSAR study published in JGR uh, for the Permian Basin that, uh, that shows that according to their model, uh, the slow slip is the dominant or a seismic processes dominate uh, the deformation in the Permian Basin. So uh, um, some final thoughts here. Uh, um, uh, so I would argue that greater use of, of alternative tools like INSAR, tilt meters, or GNSS, or alternative approaches to analyze DAS could be really helpful um, in this study. Um, we need to better understand what the relevant seismically detectable signals look like. So uh, um, using uh, regional monitoring uh, broadband seismometers, what should we be looking for in terms of uh, tremor, repeating earthquakes, swarms, et cetera? Um, and we certainly need more experimental measurements to constrain the rate state parameters for lithologies of interest. There uh, just aren't enough of those right now. So uh, some acknowledgments. Uh, uh, the research I presented today was uh, funded by the Canada First Research Excellence Fund um, through its support of the GRI program at the University of Calgary as well as uh, on my uh, NSERC discovery grant. So with that, I uh, will conclude the talk and I would be happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks Dave, really, uh, really interesting observations and thought provoking integration of those observations. Um, so just a reminder to everyone to uh, go ahead and put any questions you might have in the chat window and uh, We'll, we'll pass them to Dave to, to answer. So, oh, looks like uh, Professor Zoback has his hand up. Mark, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi, Dave. Thanks. Thanks for a very nice talk. Um, you know, there's one other mechanism we speculated about um, that leads the slow slip, and that's when a fault is poorly oriented for slip. In other words, we take a large perturbation to make it slip. And a high pore pressure perturbation, say from a hydrofrac, affects only a small part of the fault. That small part can slip, but the rest of it can't slip. And I, I was wondering what, you know, and then of course that the rest of the fault can slip only as the pore pressure then propagates along the fault and brings it to the slip, um, you know, the frictional condition. So I was wondering if it there might be a tendency for more fault slip during hydraulic fracturing when the pressure perturbation is quite high and you could simulate slip on a larger family of faults, faults of many different orientations, then say fluid injection um, due to weight, you know, water disposal when the pore pressure perturbation is, is much smaller. Anyway, it's just a, a speculation. I, I don't know if you've seen anything that would be consistent with that. 
Yeah, thanks, Mark. And I think that's a great point. So uh, um, essentially, that would be a class of slow slip activation where the slip front is tracking the diffusion front along the fault. Yeah. Uh, so as pore pressure is diffusing, diffusing, that's limiting the rate that slip can occur. Um, so uh, um, that's not something that we've actually looked at, but I think it's a really interesting uh, suggestion and that that warrants a closer look to see, you know, if we could test that that model, um, you know, through observations and uh, and modeling. So thanks for, for suggesting that. Thank, th thanks again. Hey, Dave, actually, I had a question kind of along similar lines and kind of led by your speculation that maybe there is a way to design for slow slip <laughs> to avoid induced seismicity. Um, you know, just thinking about uh, the transition between stable and unstable slip and uh, how that might behave in a, a fracture set that's seeing frac gradient type pressures during a stimulation and the, what could potentially be significant dilation of that fracture. And with that asperity model, do you know, is there any, any research or do you have any thoughts how the A and B values or maybe the frictional values might change for a significantly dilated fault system? Yeah, that's a great question, Sean. And um, you know, I need to sit down with uh, with Jeff Priest to talk about their latest measurements from the Duvernay equivalent uh, rocks that uh, they reported this week. Um, because uh, in addition to the lithologic influence, uh, they also found that uh, normal stress um, directly influenced the uh, rate state parameter. So there was, uh, with increasing normal stress, effective normal stress. Uh, there was a greater tendency towards velocity strengthening. Um, so the converse would be that uh, um, you know if we're if we're getting sort of tensile opening of a fault, then that might actually be um, pushing the fault you know closer to uh, conditional stability or velocity weakening types of uh, of behavior. So it's uh, it's complex, and there's not enough data right now to uh, um, really put all the pieces together. Uh, but it's it's not just clay content, uh, TOC, lithology. It's also the state of stress on the fault, which feeds, there's a feedback into the, the rate state behavior. Yeah, I have a question, uh, David. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, great presentation and uh, very insightful. Uh, it, it's interesting that, that uh, in the geothermal community as well, there, there has been uh, observations of, of the aseismic slip. Uh, I don't know if you uh, uh, know Francois Cornet. Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, he, he did a lot of work in, in, in the Sultz uh, EGS. Uh, and and uh, he had observed some uh, casing deformation, actually, apparently, in one of the stimulation wells. And, and he had uh, a slip of you know four to seven centimeters if i recall correctly and then uh, subsequent to that they, they did some analysis of, of the micro seismicity in the reservoir and, and were able to actually associate the micro seismicity with the uh, feature that, that had slipped at the well bore uh, which by itself had not generated any uh, actually yeah, major events at all it was pretty uh, seismic so uh so that, this is very interesting yeah very very nice but but you know uh, I, I find you know what you, what you pointed out to be uh, uh, particularly useful and that is you know being able to detect the uh, a seismic deformation uh by uh das or you know other uh other means and so uh what's your uh kind of prognosis in, in that in that front uh do you think we can actually successfully do that real time because that that's that's really i think for me the the, the prize if, if we can if we can analyze the the uh, a seismic deformation uh, real time or sub real time so that it can help you uh, mitigate injection yeah so uh, um first of all you mentioned francois cornet um i met him a number of years ago at a, a workshop in france um and then our leading edge paper <laughs> yeah we were the reviewers pointed out that uh, um, uh, a really good paper that uh, that he published describing exactly what you you just mentioned from the Sue Sue Sofere, uh, Sue Sofere, uh, uh, geothermal program, um, and uh, so yeah, so I read that paper and uh, um, yeah, that's I think very relevant to what we're looking at here. Um, now I'm personally especially bullish on DAS. 
um, as a, um, a technology that we might be able to harness for real-time monitoring. Um, and the example I showed you is one of several that we've, uh, um, we've looked at and we're in the process of um, writing up for publication. But uh, kind of as a general observation, um, you know, I find that you know, as these new techniques come along, like using low frequency DAS for inter-wellbore strain observations, um, you know, the, the state of practice is just barely kind of staying ahead of the observations. And DAS are such huge data sets. I think there's a lot of signals in the low frequency DAS that just aren't being looked at. Yeah. Um, so it, may, it may well be that uh, you know, once we know what to look for, you know, we can start finding them in, um, in other DAS programs where they just haven't fallen within the kind of narrow window of what people are looking at for low frequency strain. Um, so I think, I think that has a lot of promise. Um, and uh, um, as far as INSAR, you know, I guess um, in some ways that might seem to be a, a great thing to use because we can get such regional uh, coverage, spatial coverage. Um, but, uh, um, you know, the, I learned through interaction with Sergei Samsonov that, uh, you know, magnitude five, maybe magnitude 4.7 or something is kind of the floor for what they're able to see with kind of current uh, um, INSAR, you know, as discrete events like I, I showed. So it's only going to pick up kind of the really large uh, events. And that's a signal to noise issue with uh, INSAR. Um, so I think we're just looking for what's the best technology for, um, for trying to characterize this. Thank you very much. Very exciting. Thanks. So I'm not seeing any uh, questions in chat, so I'll maybe take the opportunity to build on your comment, Dave. So in terms of, uh, you know, you showed that nice plot of how the slow slip events relate in terms of, you know, I think it was kind of characteristic time. Does that provide some insights in terms of the, the proper frequency band to be looking at in DAS, for instance? Yeah, so the, uh, um, you know, the, our understanding of slow slip in natural fault systems is, is that there's a spectrum. Um, so, uh, um, but, uh, you know, slow slip events in natural systems can take minutes, it can take weeks, you know, so, uh, um, so I think it really depends on um, empirical observations to help constrain these things. So, uh, um, but that DAS signal that I was showing was on a time scale of hours. Um, the uh, um, INSAR, you know, we can't exactly constrain uh, the timing, but that was likely on a time scale of days um, when, uh, when that took place. So I think that kind of brackets the, what, what we think are the time scales we should be looking at um, to really understand this. And it may be that tilt meters are um, potentially um, a really good way to go for, uh, for trying to capture information on those time scales. I have a question regarding the uh, clay content and A minus B uh, sign. First of all, great presentation. Thank you so much for that. So can you uh, elaborate more on that? Uh, if uh, the plot that you showed for A minus B versus clay content is for one single formation or uh, you include also Permian Basin in that data set? Uh, you showed yeah, that. So, uh, yeah, um, A so minus B positive. Show. Trying to reverse back because up to in, it. Uh, in Permian Basin, a lot of shelf formations have high uh, carbonate content. Uh, so I just I was wondering if it covers Permian Basin or not. Yes. Yeah. So if uh, if Mark Zoback is still online, um, he might be able to answer okay. that a little bit better. This awesome. uh, yeah, I, I grabbed uh, published measurements uh, from shales and fine grain rocks uh, from the publications that are shown here. Coley and Zoback. Um, actually looked at three different shale plays. Yeah, um, so, so I, I'm online. I, you know, I don't, I don't think we had any um, Permian samples back, you know, 2012 or so when we did these experiments, but we had Haynesville, Barnett, Eagleford, and uh, I believe one other. Um, but I wouldn't suspect that the, uh, you know, Wolf Camp or other Permian plays would be significantly different as, mm -hmm. as Dave shows here. You know, these results are consistent with other investigators using samples from other places. Yeah, the uh, the other publications did not have TOC. So uh, um, uh, Mark, the Coley and Zoback paper 
I think showed a really nice correlation with the clay plus TOC. Um, you know, that's probably better than clay alone, but I didn't have that data for these other ones. So I just used clay. Um, so I took the clay only part from, from that publication and combined it with these other ones here. You know, in our case, the clay was so much more than the TOC. I think if we had plotted it as a function of clay, it would look pretty similar. Thank you. Great. Well, that that takes us up to the end of the uh, the scheduled hour period. So, so on behalf of everyone, thanks, Dave, for the uh, really interesting presentation. And uh, remind everyone, November fourth is the the next Arma webinar. Stan Sosky, Polish Academy of Sciences, will be uh, presenting. So look forward to uh, to Stan's presentation, and uh, just watch for the uh, the invitations from Marty. Thank you so much, everyone. We, we can hang out, uh, hang around uh, for uh, informal questions if you have any. I see one question from Pat McLennan. We can talk about it in the informal section of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Dave, if you have a few minutes, maybe. Sure, I'm happy to stick around and uh, um, try to answer some of the questions that are on here. I see the one from Pat McClellan. Um, so, uh, um, and uh, so Pat, you're just wondering why we haven't seen more of these NSAR uh, events. Um, and uh, um, what I can tell you is uh, um, I know that uh, Sergey's group at the Canada Center for Earth Observation is going back, you know, now that they've sort of trained their eyes and know what to look for. But by, by the way, what their, their mandate is to look for slope stability, so landslides on river valleys. So they're not actually looking for earthquakes, um, but, uh, um, and, and they have no mandate to do casing deformation studies uh, with that group. Um, so kind of in his spare time, he's pouring through the data to look for other examples. Um, he hasn't reached out to me to say he's got some, another really exciting one to talk about. So um, based on that alone, I would say that these are pretty rare. Um, and so uh, it probably some kind of Gutenberg-Richter statistic um, and so, you know, for every magnitude three or four equivalent, or for every, you know, for every magnitude five, we get many, many more that would be equivalent to four or more than that for magnitude three, and those just aren't detectable with uh, INSAR. And the other thing is, it's not just the magnitude, it's also the depth. Um, so the sensitivity, sort of the ground displacement from INSAR, um, it's kind of an exponential like decrease in sensitivity as you get to deeper events. Um, so the particular case study that, that I showed was a kind of a combination of relatively shallow within the Montney um, and at the large end of what is likely the spectrum for, uh, um, for these events. So that's kind of the best answer I can give. What, what was the, uh, the depth of that particular um, So the, the 2017 or, or event, um, they uh, had um, 1.8 kilometers depth. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the completion was about two kilometers. Um, so that was from the, uh, the inversion of the ground deformation signal. It's, it's just, it just strikes me that, you know, especially in the Horn River Basin and, and some of the other Montney uh, areas where, you know, at times people injected at 20 cubes a minute and 100,000 cubes of fluid, uh, you know, in, in giant treatments setting records. Um, uh, surely these might have induced similar sort of events and and why had they not been uh picked up yeah. in insar previously so. well i think um i suspect it's a bit of a needle in a haystack situation because of the huge volumes of uh um, of insar data but i think yeah. someone like you who is knowledgeable about you know sort of uh, industry completion programs where casing deformation has been observed in the same room with an insider specialist might be really productive um, because they don't yeah. they don't know any of this they, they don't know where to be, be looking they're just looking yeah no it's a bit of a, yeah where to look and 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 the yeah. like well no no i uh, I've, I've been intrigued with it for a while i i noticed the publication back a while ago um the only other comment was i think i think in your slide it had referenced greater than 50 millimeters on some of our feral creek uh, deformations and and in fact, it wasn't greater. The maximum recorded value from casing 
um, multi-finger caliper log interpretations was 50, 50 millimeters. Okay, yeah. So I'll um, uh, I'll correct that on the slide. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, you know, typ typical deformations on those large ones were were in that one to two centimeter range. But but there was a, a unique case where we had multiple deformations from the same event that that caused a large plane to slip. Um, and we did have at least one event that made a, 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 a casing deformation that was uh, coincident with a magnitude 3.1 earthquake. So there have been seismic uh, uh, events associated with casing deformations too, but but rare, quite rare. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, but our our model is very inclusive. So uh, if if it's triggering slip, then it looks like the 2016 Duvernay event that uh, we had, and then the more recent one, there was no earthquake that uh, that was triggered by this a seismic slip. Yeah. Thanks. So it looks like there's also a question from Emilio Rob. Emilio, are you are you still there? Feel free to unmute yourself. I just saw his name in the list, but so Davey's wondering if. Uh, Poor elastic stress effects away from a frac could uh, could induce slow slip. Yeah, so I, I don't see why not because uh, um, essentially the argument is that um, if we have a, a fault which is um, sort of put into a frictionally unstable condition somehow, either by poor fluid pressure increase or poor elastic stress, um, then if it's velocity strengthening, then we would expect it to be slow slip. Um, so, uh, uh, so you could mix and match poor elastic or, you know, direct poor fluid energy or poor fluid pressure increase with the slow slip triggering model, and uh, that that would work. And it also looks like there's a question from Chengdu Li. Um, again, go ahead and unmute yourself if you uh, would like. I'll maybe go ahead and read it here, Dave. He's wondering if the rate state uh, parameters, if there'd be a scale dependence versus uh, lithological controls. Yeah, so I'll try to answer that question. Uh, if you recall back to the um, diagram from Bergman's paper that uh, um, uh, near the Parkfield segment of the San Andreas Fault, where there were little fault patches and asperities um, where we're seeing repeating earthquakes and so on. Um, I think that and, you know, kind of general takeaway from a lot of research is that faults are heterogeneous, you know, stress is heterogeneous, um, friction is heterogeneous uh, on the faults, and um, that heterogeneity actually explains some of the observations uh, uh, that we're seeing. So I think that speaks to the scale dependence that uh, Chang Ho Lee is, is mentioning here, because uh, um, you know, if we're, if we're looking at laboratory measurements from a single core sample, then, you know, that characterizes one small part of the fault. But, you know, really, we need many, many such uh, measurements to characterize the heterogeneity as well. And Jango is pointing out that his mic doesn't work. So apparently Microsoft can make people a seismic as well. <laughs> this is Kate Baker. Hi, Kate. You go ahead, Kate. I just wanted to point out um, all of these studies are of relatively shallow things, but there is a pitfall in that we in the oil and gas industry like to refer to carbonates as carbonates, but it makes a tremendous difference whether you are dealing with limestone or dolomite. They are mechanically very, very different when you get below 10,000 feet on a normal geothermal gradient, um, one will be almost fully ductile and the other one not at all. So we really do need to be more specific, not just in talking about shale contents uh, or clay contents rather and TOC contents, but also in specifying whether we are dealing in a carbonate section with one that is largely limestone or one that is dolomitized. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Thanks, Kate. I think that's a great point. And um, a lot of the uh, limestones in the Western Canada sedimentary basin have undergone substantial dolomitization. 
um, but it's not ubiquitous. So we're, we still see, you know, limestones, pure limestones and, and dolomites. And oftentimes the dolomitization increases the porosity as well. So that, uh, so we have conventional oil and gas pools, which are where the porosity was created by dolomitization. And, and you know, some of the papers that I'm familiar with, um, they actually invoke basement faults to explain the dolomitization because they, uh, um, they argue that you needed some source of fluids to do, you know, for mass balance to get the, the dolomite. Um, I wish I had uh, more um, accurate and precise maps that show the extent of, of dolomitization in the Wobman and the Bolt formations, uh, because I think those are two are both really important you know, in the, from the perspective of the, uh, um, you know, induced seismicity that, that we're seeing. But yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying, you know, uh, um, in order for these massive carbonates, dolomites or limestones, but uh, I, th I think dolomites are particularly important. Um, we have to consider the rheology of, of that rock as well. And there is a 7% volume reduction when you convert limestone into dolomite. The substitution of the magnesium will lead to a 7% volume change. Yeah, and I think that uh, essentially is why you get more porosity in the dolomitic reservoirs is because of the volume reduction. But I understand that you need massive amounts of fluid in order to make the mass balance, um, the calcium magnesium substitution mass balance to work. And that's why people are talking about these uh, basement faults. Excuse me. It depends when the dolomitization happens. It could happen before the limestone actually got buried by exchange with seawater. <clears throat> or it yeah, might happen uh, late. At this point, what you say is true. Yeah, I think in that diagenetic, or I think in Western Canada, it's mainly diagenetic dolomitization. So it happened relatively mm -hmm. late. <clears throat> and, and therefore, you know, something exotic must have happened to, to supply the fluids that are needed, the volume of fluids that are needed. Totally agreed. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kate. Any, anybody else have any, any questions for Dave? One more, maybe uh, Dave, um, Pat McClellan here. Uh, um, you, the results you reported from uh, Jeff Priest and his students' uh, work, I think I heard you say these were Duvernay equivalent, but from the Rockies, where where in fact are those samples uh, taken? Is that is that an outcrop from uh, somewhere near near uh, Canmore? No, it's not near Canmore. Um... It is uh, um, near Nordegg, um, so oh, okay. there's a uh, sampling locality. It's a Perdri formation, or Perdri oh sample, right, okay, yeah, um, which is Duvernay equivalent. And so there's a big, <clears throat> you know, atypically undeformed section of the the Perdri formation, um, which has become a good sampling locality, but it requires helicopter access to get there. I think I saw friction angles down to, uh, or friction uh, coefficients down to 0.55 or something on your diagram. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, is it principally a uh, quartz rich? Is there any clay in it? Uh, uh, any, any comment on the mineralogy of those tests? Yeah, I think it's uh, um, carbonate, um, you know, uh, various uh, compositions um, and uh, quartz. So kind of a quartz carbonate, carbonate mixture. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, not much clay. Um, no, I didn't think, yeah. No, so, uh, um, you know, so the previous discussion of the relationship to clay, <clears throat> clay content doesn't really apply. Um, I was kind of surprised because it's carbonate rich and we're sort of pointing to events in the Wobman and the DeBolt, um, you know, carbonate uh, units. And yet it was all velocity strengthening with one exception from their measurements. Um, so uh, the picture is a little more complicated than just clay um, in understanding these things. And, and, and are those friction coefficients from the normal stress range at, at those 2,000 meter depths? Is that, is that where the... 
Yeah, so um, they they did look at it was a triaxial <clears throat> uh, rig that they were using, and so uh, a range of different uh, <clears throat> stress conditions. So sure, yeah. Yep, I'll have to get a copy of that. <laughs> It'll be presented at the MIC uh, annual meeting if you're attending that in November. So. Oh, okay. All the more reason. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and kind of wrap this up? It sounds like Dave's struggling with his voice. So yeah. before Dave becomes a seismic as well, let's uh, <laughs> thanks again, Dave, for. Uh, for the talk and uh, look forward to hearing more and good luck with that new uh, Alberta premiere. Okay, thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you so okay. much, David. I appreciate it. Have a good weekend. Thanks all, excellent session. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thank you.